All right, see Jumbo, everybody. Welcome to Satora's Black History Corner Internet Program. I am your host, Catherine Hunter Williams, and my co host, Miss Catherine Blake, or Hello, also everybody. known as Miss B. Uh, we had some te technical difficulties. Uh, while we were trying to do this live so we had to do it in another form and we're d recording it and then John's gonna put it up in a different way okay so let's move forward and and we're like a few we are 20 minutes behind now right it's all right that's okay so we're just gonna do your story today and then uh, I'll do I want okay, I want to hear yours <sighs> <laughs> okay. All right, let's go, Miss right. B. All right, wait a minute, go. wait a minute. Okay. I ain't finished yet. Right. Today, Miss B is going to teach our story about the Mino of Benin. They're also called the Amazon Warriors. Benin is in the lower part of Nigeria, a country located in West Africa. Uh, and I'm going to talk about, uh, teach about uh, Michael Bannerman, also known as Eugene Jacques Bullard. Who is also who is known as the first American fighter pilot of our story, and he has a very interesting story. Mm -hmm. So right now, Miss B, go ahead. All right, uh, the Dahame Amazons. The Dahame. That's D A H O M E Y. Dahame Amazons are the only documented all-female official frontline combat arms military unit in modern history. They were tough, intense, butt-kicking women, single-mindedly devoted to hardening themselves into ruthless instruments of battlefield destruction. And these machete-yielding, musket-slinging women terminators were rightly feared throughout Western Africa for over 250 years. Can you imagine that? Yeah, we said they had Winchester rifles. Yeah. Clubs. You said machetes. Machetes. Knives. Yeah, yeah knives. And they were under female command. Amen. Not only for their fanatical devotion to battle, but for their utter refusal to back down. They did not back down. They did not retreat from any fight unless expressingly ordered to do so by their king. If you were some poor, malicious soldier hanging out around your barracks and you saw these scary chicks suddenly start charging out of the woods in your direction, screaming their war chant with their muskets bearing fire and their signature double-edged two-foot-long machetes brandishing threatening over their heads you have one fleeting moment to overcome your <laughs> you better run and defend yourself you better run because if you fail to kill them and i do mean if you fail to kill them these women some murderous women was going to club you unconscious with their musket butts, drag you back to their capital, chop off your head with one swing of their machete, one swing, boil the skin off your decapitated head, and then use your skull to decorate the royal palace. Wow. They were created around 1645 by the Dahame King Adu Hanzo. The Amazons were initially designed to serve as the frontal assault shock troops sent in to crush the enemy spirits and skulls in a frenzied wave of bloodshed fury. Instead, they started out as a small team of women who specialized in bringing down elephants. And you know how big elephants are, big 2,000 pound pachyderms. And women are doing this, I'd be scared to death. Well, they was, you know, wealthy and also held high in status. Yeah. In their communities. But can you imagine the mentality of these women? Yes. See, my thing is it says a history of female empowerment. Okay. <laughs> I can. <laughs> the information I got, yours says a whole oh. nother thing. But mine says a history of female empowerment. And yes, I can. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Women can be, I think women can be more of a warrior any day than a man. I really do. Well, this because is we can come up with some 
Thank you. You said it. Ruthless. Ruthless. Devious. Yes. Things that women can come up with. These women were no joke. One of the mottos was, if soldiers go to war, they should conquer or die. And that's what they were willing to do. So when they went out there, they were they were they were they weren't planning that they, mm -hmm. they they would they'd die for their cause. Well, they would eventually go out on organized. They were organized, efficient pachyderm hunts, while the men were out fighting fighting the wars. And eventually, possibly due to the lack of manpower, or possibly uh, because of their ruthless efficiency, there's that word ruthless again. Mm -hmm. Ado, King Ado Hanzo promoted them to his personal bodyguard unit, expanding the unit to 800 women warriors with spears, bows, and war clubs, which in turn grew in the size of an elite military unit of over 4,000 warriors. And as a shout out to their roots in the Amazon, chose to honor their heritage by naming their first battalion the Elephant Destroyers. Yes. And the second battalion, it should be noted, were known as the Reapers. And that, that is so scary. Women who uh, ditch those pesky muskets and instead went to battle armed with razor sharp three foot machetes but you know throughout africa uh you know today modern time you know in rwanda they killed a lot of people with machetes they use machetes throughout razor they have sharp. guns but i think that's a preferred weapon it's is the uh, uh, machete that's like uh hands-on killing mm. Cause see, with, a gun, with a gun, you can throw it far yeah. away. But hands on. And you could chop them up with mm -hmm. a machete. And you know? it's double edged too. And they love using that because even Buku Haram, who has uh, Bring Back Our Girls, mm -hmm. that's what they did. They went in there and they just they killed some thousands of people. Oh, oh, we'll talk about that later. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, because there's some interesting things that happened. And might as well jump into it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they they have released uh, some of the hostages. They have Buko Haram because yeah because the uh, um, the Nigerian military is closing in on them. Oh, they finna get rid of them. It's about time. But they, they they released these hostages right now. But they is none of them is from the Bring Back Our Girls, which was oh. over two thousand. So. But at least they're getting them, mm -hmm. you know. And I don't think they'll ever get bring back our girls. The girls that was kidnapped last year, I think mm -hmm. it was 214. Yeah. That got kidnapped last year, wintertime, I think, mm -hmm. here. Um, I don't no, think. I remember we went out there March with uh, that young lady from Nigeria. That was, it wasn't cold. No, I'm talking about when this happened in over in Africa, in the oh, Congo. Yeah. Right. That's where it's going. That's when it was first started yeah, out in the right, Congo. Right. Uh, the Republic of uh, Congo or whatever, but I don't think I think they done done our they done done whatever they gonna do with those girls and sold them and whatever, and then they went on a rampage and they uh, conquered and killed a whole lot of other people in the villages and different things and kidnapped them. Well, they are letting them go because they the, the the if the election is over there, they got a new president in there and he ain't playing. All right, it's about time. Yeah. Uh, another motto that the, the Hame Amazon women had was, get a load of this one, give a dog a bone and he will break it and eat it, so will we do with the cities of the enemy. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they something. Uh huh. But also, they you know some think the name what derives from Amazos, a dash m a z o s, and it means without breasts. Woo. Yeah. As they cut off their right breast in order to throw the the javelin. Well, yeah. Right. Ain't that something? Yeah. Can you imagine that? Yeah, I can imagine that. Uh oh. That they would do, and you know, that's, they're warriors, they're yeah. They're warriors, absolutely. And the breast would get in your, your way, way, but if you don't have it there, uh, you can throw better. Mm -hmm. You know, throw over that, that way something? better, yeah. Ooh. Some of the things that in Africa is just amazing to me anyway, you know, like uh, they, when they do the, 
uh, circumcision of women there. I mean, it's just some things that yeah. go on. I heard they have stopped that now. It maybe. Yeah. Someplace. Maybe because some places it's so traditional. Yeah. It's like us going to church is traditional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't. That you just don't know about it, but they did right. fight it. But that's a very interesting point. Uh, one of the uh, the Amazon's motto was conquer or die. These women swore an oath to die facing the enemy. Any Amazon that fled a battle without being ordered to withdraw by the king himself was summarily executed on the spot. Wow. And quite honestly, these chicks didn't have much tolerance for anyone else who didn't adhere to their admittedly strict rules. And they did it a little far sometimes. Like after they conquered an enemy city, while the king and his men were pillaging and introducing themselves to their new subjects, the Hadame, the Dahame Amazons would spend the next couple of days running through the wilderness looking for enemy soldiers who had fled the battle. Ain't that something? Going, checking out, finding their own folks that, that didn't fight. I didn't think they... <laughs> but they, you know, I mean, they have some, uh, some things. They, like, uh, once a member of the Mino, the women were forbidden to have sex, oh, lest yeah. they fell pregnant and when were unable to fight. And any man who tried mm. to touch a soldier would be sentenced to death for it's a crime. Wow. That's <laughs> no joke. That's no joke there. That's some That's stuff no there That's right no there. No and then joke. it says the word Mino means uh, my mother and fun. And mm. they are fun. They are called funs, uh, which is a tribe. But uh, then it says they are... Uh, but you look at the images, and, and you can even look at the images that we're putting up uh, of these female warriors. There is little in their countenance to suggest that they are maternal. And if you look in these pictures, don't look like they have any breasts at all. Well, those pictures ain't up there, so no, don't okay. comment on them. Okay. Okay. Because if they, well, I, uh, let me say this. I'm not about sure which one he I put up. There. Okay. I think I put this one up though. Okay. Uh, but I can't see it because uh, whatever. Go well, ahead. If there were any of the women warriors that didn't fight, and they caught them, let me tell you what they did. They dragged the terrible warrior back by their hair. Then they spend the next couple of days cutting the guy's ears off, gouging out their eyes, and cutting off their fingers. A process sounds torturous. To that me. would take three days. Torture. And on the fourth day, they would mercifully drag that person before the king and decapitate him. Then lick his blood off the blade of their weapons. Woo! Then the guy's skull would be thrown in a pile with the rest. The Dahame, the Dahame would break out into one of the heroic battle chants, and then everyone would get ready to hammer, to get hammered on rum and gin and <laughs> dance until the sun come up. I said, wow. They would do that to one of their own. Yeah, well, if you ran. The Dahami, Amazon, or Mino were all, as I said, fine. Mm -hmm. All female military regiments of the King of Dahomey in the present day Republic of Benin. And it lasted until the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. They were so named by Western observers and historians due to their similarity to the semi mythical Amazons of ancient. Anatolia mm -hmm. and the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. Very interesting story about them. Well, just this one last bit right here. I, I just, I, I'm not saying that I love this part, but it's it's just to show you something else about these women when they were fighting the French, with a little hesitant to open fire on it, any army of gunslinging women, the French men, but. They found their resolve pretty quickly <laughs> when the first line of the Amazon troop hit the wooden stockade, pulled it apart with their hands. 
then stuck their muskets through the hole and blasted the defenders at close range. At one point during this battle, the Dahame would even make it over the wall. And one French soldier wrote about seeing his best friend decapitated with one sling of the machete that they had and from a pissed <laughs> off Amazon. Yeah. That's fierce. When the second soldier knocked the weapon out of the woman's hand with his rifle butt, she threw him on the ground and tore out his throat with her teeth. Wow. These were those Amazon women. They was no joke. There's more about them. And you can get it on, uh, this is called the Warrior Queens of Dahomey. Yes. And that's D-A-H-O-M-E-Y. And then I have, mine just came from uh, the empowerment Woo. of uh, the history of female empowerment. The Mino of Benin. Mm -hmm. And Mino also means uh, mother in Fon. Fon is a tribe that's over there in, in uh, Nigeria. They're a tribe member. These women were no joke. So they, uh, the group of female warriors were referred to as Mino, meaning our mothers in the Fon language by the male army, army of Dahomey. And then uh, this finally, the troops were disbanded when the kingdom became a French protectorate, I guess, or colony. Mm -hmm. The last surviving Amazon of Dahomey is thought to have been a woman named Nawi, who died in 1979. Wow. That was the end of that. Wow. That was, that's a, that was an awesome story, and that was a, you know, nice, yes. some nice hour story. Woo. It's a very good story, uh, good story of the warrior queens, warrior queens of Dahomey. Well, we have here in this country, we have um, women that go to the war and they fight, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so, and I just feel women can be very vicious. I mean, just, I feel that we can oh, be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're, we're nurturers and everything, but yes. don't mess with our territory. <laughs> okay, don't step into it at all. All right, thank you, Miss B. Woo. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this here is uh, uh, was sent to me by Elliot McCants. Oh. Yeah. Priest. Yeah, Priest Elliot McCants, and is he is not listed in our U.S. history website as one of the top 100s. Oh. And I had no idea who this guy was until I finally got it from uh, Priest Elliot. He was Eugene Jock Bullard, the first ever American African aviator who did not fly for America. Aha. Uh -huh. Eugene Jock? Eugene, U -G, I mean E U G E N E, Jock, J A C Q U E S Bullard, B U L L A R D. Mm hmm. He uh, left this country because his father was hanged. Prior to Eugene's dad being brutally murdered, he spoke of how France was a nation that respected all men regardless of the color of his skin. Now he didn't change his name to uh, Michael uh, Bannerman until he was over there. Mm. His story was bought. Uh, well, this is the person who put the story on. His story was brought to her by a Cossack, Mary Helen Gass, who shared Michael Bannerman's photo. And that's the him in his uh, aviation. I don't know if John has that picture up of the one where he was young. Yeah, that's one. I got a picture of him in uniform, right? Yeah, yeah when he was young, yeah. yeah. Photo from a series that she was following titled Acts of Slave, the website. That's mm -hmm. an interesting website, too. Mm -hmm. Go check it out. It's called Acts of Slave, the website series. You can read the entire history of Eugene Jacques Bullock upon the African-American section of Air Power's military website. The website has these opening remarks that America's first black aviator did not fly for the country of his birth, America, but for his adopted country of France, a country for which he was severely wounded and received many medals for valor. Jean himself 
also known as Michael Bannerman, was a man who hesitated to speak of himself, but one who stood on the principles of honesty and integrity. Hmm. He treated everyone as he wished to be treated, and because of that, he was very well liked. This, I, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself, because this man did some stuff, and he was very well honored. He lived by the belief that all men were created equal and should be treat, treated accordingly. Eugene Jacques, 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 am I pronouncing that right? Jock. Jock. Bullard was born on October 9, 1894 in Columbus, Georgia, the seventh of ten children born to William Octave Bullard, a black man from Martinique, and Josephine Yokali Thomas, a Creek Indian. Oh. Eugene's father could trace their family roots as far back as the American Revolution. Hallelujah. Mm. Uh, Eugene said his father was an educated man who worked hard as a laborer and treasured his hours at home telling his children tales from the books he read. It was his father's influence and those stories that would shape Eugene's direction in life. That's why I tell people, start reading and speaking to your children when they're in the womb. Mm -hmm. And they, are, they can hear you, mm -hmm. you know. You can even start reciting. Say mm -hmm. Psalms 23. And when they come, they'll know it. They'll just know it because you, they done heard it from you through the womb. Mm -hmm. But you can also read stories to them. Tell them their history and all mm -hmm. kind of stuff while they're in the womb. Absolutely. And it shapes their lives like this. his mm -hmm. father shaped his life. Eugene, divided by family loyalty and a quest for freedom, tearfully left his Columbus, Georgia home in 1902 at the tender age of eight. The catalyst for his early departure was the near unjust lynching of his father. The latter incident brought to Eugene's mind the words his father had spoken to him earlier. In France, a man is accepted as a man regardless of the color of his skin. He left home seeking this paradise in France. And a lot of other ones did that too. James Baldwin, mm -hmm. uh, that were uh, into the writings, the uh, literary. He was a poet, poet wrote poetry. It, it was quite a few that left here and went and lived in France. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Eugene Bullard later in life wearing many of the decorations and medal he fought so hard to earn. Uh, the photograph that, uh, that we have up there now is when he was uh, uh, today. Um, he also had a nightclub called Le Grand Duc where he was the host and part owner. Bullard entertained the likes of Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Gloria Swanson, and England's Prince of Wales. He opened his own club soon after his marriage, which soon became one of Paris's most famous entertainment spots for singers and musicians of his time. Mm. Okay. During the war, or by the end of the war, Bullard had became a national hero in France. But he later moved back to the United States where he was, of course, completely unknown. Practically no one in the United States was aware of it when in 1959, the French government named him a National Chevalier or Knight. Okay. In 1960, the President of France, Charles de Gaulle, paid a state visit, visit to the United States. And when he arrived, he said that one of the first things he wanted to do was to meet Bullard. Really? Yeah. That sent the White House staff scrambling <laughs> because most of them, of course, had never heard of him. They finally located him in New York City, and de Gaulle traveled there to meet him personally. At, that, at the time, Eugene Bullard was working as an elevator operator. Oh, wow. All this greatness he's done, he worked as an elevator operator. Y'all know what an elevator operator is. It used to be back in the day. Be, yeah. They would sit, be, be, look, I think downtown at that bank, um, I guess Genesee, whatever the name of the bank, America. Anyways, downtown on 2nd Street. They have, um, they used to have operators sitting in the, in the uh, elevator and asking you what floor, and they took care of all that. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to do it. Well, they, you know, that's an elevator operator. Yeah, young folks don't know nothing about that. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't know about a lot of things. 
But you know, it's, it was a low paying job, and this man was had uh, he, the president of France was looking for him because of what he had done. Not long after Eugene Bullard met with the president of France, he passed away. Oh. And today, very, very few Americans, and especially American Africans, even know who he is. Wow. But now you do. Aha. Mm -hmm. Yep, now you do, don't you? Eugene Jacques Bullard. Michael, also known as Michael Bannerman. Michael Bannerman. And I hope you'll be able to find opportunities to tell other people about this great American hero that probably only one American in one a million in one million has ever heard of. Wow. And that's our story about Eugene Jacques Bullard, <laughs> also oh, known as Michael Bannerman. Mm -hmm. And you could go ask a slave the web series and find information about him. Ask a slave. Ask a slave website. Also, uh, Miss B told our story about the warrior queens of Dahomey, uh, Africa's most famous corp of female warriors. Woo. Kingdom of Dahomey, now called the Republic of Du Benin, is located in Western Africa, bordered by Togo on the west, on the west, and the Nigeria on the east. Mm -hmm. Dahomey has a unique feature in its history that reads like something out of Greek mythology. They had Africa's most well-known corp of female warriors. And that's not mythology. That's for real. That's for real. That's for real. That's for real. Otherwise, we wouldn't be telling our story <laughs> on here if it wasn't for real. We hope y'all enjoyed that. Satoris Black History Corner Internet Program comes to you via satellite at allpointstv.com. You can watch our program every second and fourth Monday of the month unless the day falls on a holiday. Starting at 3.30 p.m. Also be sure to watch what's going on with political pundit Dr. George Moss every Monday at 2 p.m. Also would like to announce that the Comet Study Group has come back together. We meet on the second Thursday, which I think the next one would be October 8th, Thursday, October 8th at 5 p.m. at the Flint Public Library. Okay. Uh, Comet is also known as Ancient Egypt, and that's what we study. And we also study American African uh, history. So any, all of us are welcome to come and be a part of our program, the Comet Study Group um, at the Flint Public Library at 5 p.m. October 8th, Thursday. Yeah, Thursday, October 8th at 5 p.m. Dr. George Moss is our discussion leader and um, Elvin Barron is our second discussion leader. I am the coordinator. And we have some great time. That we do. We have some real great time. Yeah, sister, she knows. <laughs> they fall out with George, but that's okay. Because yeah. when they fall out with him, it just, you, I think you can disagree to agree. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Or disagree, agree to disagree, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But some people fall out with the man, but he's telling them the truth. Yeah. He so, has an interesting thought pattern. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he is. He it does. Makes you think. <laughs> He do, yeah, he makes you think. Yeah. But that's his. I always say, this is George's opinion, not mine. Okay? Because <laughs> I used to be on this program, uh, What's Going On? And when I was on there, George would come somewhere and I would say, he would speak something that was like, and I would say, that's George's opinion, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my friend. That's my friend. That's my friend and my brother. As always, I like to say, Asante. A Swahili. Oh, did I say that uh, what's going on with political pundit yeah. Dr. Joe? Did I say every Monday at 2 p.m.? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. As always, I like to say Asante, which is a Swahili word for thanks to all of you who have watched our program today. And if you have liked what you have seen and heard, please pass it on mm -hmm. to others. You know, and I agree with John. John said he would like for George's program and my poor program to pop and let's make it big. Amen. And the only way we can do that is with y'all help. So come on, pass it on and help right. us. Until next time, my God-given, incredibly awesome, great, powerful, strong, and beautiful black family. Keep on keeping on with us. Amani, which means peace.